conversation. Uh, my name is Dr. Aggie Hurst. I am a senior lecturer in international relations theory and methods here in the Department of War Studies. And I'm also the EDI lead um, for the department in addition to sitting on the decolonization of the work stream steering uh, group uh, for the EDI uh, faculty group as well. Uh, I'm delighted to be welcoming you to today's session, uh, which is a discussion of the 100th anniversary special issue of the journal International Affairs, which is titled Race and Imperialism in International Relations, Theory and Practice. Um, what we're going to be doing in today's session is hearing from the special issues two fabulous editors uh, who I will introduce to you in a moment. Uh, first, just a quick word on what it is that the special issue is trying to do. Um, the special issue explores the question of whether there is an academic policy divide uh, in the context of discussion on race and imperialism in international relations. Um, and in this 100th anniversary special issue, um, what uh, the uh, editors and the contributions are seeking to do is to think about the role of academia as a supplier of knowledge uh, for colonial policies, uh, to think secondly about the influence of imperial practice and policymakers in shaping IR and academic knowledge production, and then uh, thirdly and importantly contesting um, from, from academics or or contestation I should say, uh, from academics and or practitioners against racial hierarchies in knowledge production and policymaking. So I'm delighted to welcome our two uh, fabulous, guests, uh, our fabulous guests today who are the editors of this brilliant uh, new forthcoming special issue. Um, first of all, we have uh, Jasmine K. Ghani, who is Senior Lecturer in the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews, and also co-director of the Center for Syrian Studies. Uh, Dr. Ghani writes and teaches on colonialism, race, knowledge production, US-Syrian relations, and ideologies and social movements, uh, particularly in the Middle East. She is author of The Role of Ideology in Syrian US Relations, which has, uh, came out in 2014 with Palgrave and also co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Middle East and North African State and State Systems that came out in 2019. Also author of uh, Actors and Dynamics in Syrian Conflicts Middle Phase. Uh, recently, last year, I believe, came out with Routledge. Um, our other fabulous speaker is uh, Dr. Jenna Marshall, who is senior researcher at the Chair of Development Policy and Postcolonial Studies at the Universitat Kaisel in Germany. Uh, she previously held the Sassoon Visiting Fellow in South Asian and Black History at the University of Oxford and serves as co-convener of the post of uh, the colonial, post-colonial and decolonial uh, CPD working group uh, of BISA. Um, Dr. Marshall's work looks at the political economy of the global south, non-Western intellectual history and critical and anti-racist methodologies of knowledge production and pedagogy. So it's my great pleasure to welcome the two of you here this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for your excellent work on this new special issue. Um, what we've decided to do today is to structure this as a discussion, as a conversation back and forward. So I'll invite uh, both Dr. Marshall and Dr. Ghani, um, firstly, to, to provide some opening uh, remarks and contextualization about the special issue. And then we'll go from there to pose a few more questions and bring in some discussion and reflections as well. Uh, so shall I go uh, firstly perhaps to Dr. Marshall, would you like to tell us a little bit about this special issue, what motivated you to curate it? Over to you. Thank you so much, Aggie, and thank you all um, for joining us here today. Uh, I, yeah, I just want to just chart out some of the motivations and the aims of the special issue. Uh, Jasmine and I had been in conversation over some period of time when the open call for the special issue came about. And we were really motivated in particular by the moment, which was that of the murder of George Floyd, as well as the subsequent Black Lives Matter protests. And we both were working on race, you know, broadly defined, and we wanted to make legible in a way on the moment. And we thought, okay, well, International Affairs, world-renowned journal, how can we think about the production of knowledge and what, as well as policy by putting race and empire at the center of our conversations? So I, that was the kickoff point. And, and then the proposal continued and we were fortunate enough to be um, accepted um, to be the guest editors for the, for the special issue. But I just want to briefly identify four, 
I think, or maybe five of the, of the broad aims uh, that we wanted to um, identify and pursue for the project. And, and the first was, we wanted to take the moment, we wanted to take the occasion as one of reflection. Um, we wanted to reflect the journal's history, but also its continued relevance to policy and how the legacies of race and empire have in, in a way worked to constrain how we think about the international. And I think for many who study empire or even study race, empire is you know, confined to the past. And we wanted to actually push against that um, logic and think about how empire, um, I guess with a capital E has ended, but there were still um, uh, colonial afterlives. And we wanted to interrogate how these afterlives were reproduced and sustained. And also with race in particular, race is typically confined to the domestic sphere. Um, and we typically see this uh, in, in the United States in particular, there's um, a plethora of work um, there, but we wanted to then again broaden how we conceive of the international and look at race as actually one of the structuring logics um, of the international. And again, how that inflects policy. So the second aim for us following on from that was to offer a corrective to the systemic denial and erasures of race and imperialism to the study of IR. And then thirdly, as I've mentioned, we wanted to broaden what could be considered acceptable within the discipline. So when you read the special issue, you would see that it's not simply foreign policy as we understand it in terms of national security policy, but broader understandings of what policy is. So we look at, for instance, um, the, the politics of memory, for instance, and how that is meted out throughout the different, different countries. And then also we wanted to render intelligible the political life of marginalized peoples and communities and those who typically reside outside of the epistemic communities within the academy, as well as in the policy world. And then I'll just end here with the fifth aim of the paper. And that was to also grapple with the complicities of the academy. And as you so well put in, in your introduction for us, the idea that, and Jasmine will speak to this later, the idea of how the academy has helped to, has been used as a site for producing knowledge for the purpose of empire. So with that in mind, it was how do we then grapple with these complici complicities, including our own, um, so it became quite um, self-reflective as well. So I hope that gives you a, a little bit of a, a, a taste or a primer of our thoughts going into the special issue. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I think, as you so articulately say, you know, beginning our analyses or attempts to grapple with these questions with the idea of our own embeddedness in the institutions that, that historically, but also today to perpetuate these relationships is, is so key. Um, so thanks so much. Great, um, over now to you, Dr. Ghani, for, for your uh, reflections on, on that question of, of the motivations of, of curating the issue. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Aggie. Thank you for such a warm uh, welcome and introduction. I um, also just want to say a brief thanks to Amanda, who's not here at the moment, but she was really instrumental in organizing this um, and everybody who's here. Um, a huge thank you to Jenna as well. Um, it's just been really wonderful co-editing uh, this special issue with Jenna and thinking through this with her. Um, and Jenna's covered some really foundational um, points in terms of what motivated us uh, in doing this special issue. Really huge thank you and credit as well to International Affairs as um, the number one leading journal um, to have the courage, right, to select our proposal, which we thought this might be a bit too radical <laughs> for International Affairs, but, but they were bold enough to, to take it in that direction and been really supportive and really enthusiastic about this project. And I think that's really helped and been really uplifting. And so as Jenna mentioned, there's some key um, arguments and propositions that we're putting forward with the special issue, which 
we're so delighted with all of the contributions, all of the articles which have coalesced to bring these arguments forward. And, and the process actually was a very iterative one um, where we held a workshop um, at the beginning of, in January of 2021, we brought all of the contributors together and they presented their work and what they're hoping to develop in their articles. And there's just some really fantastic conversations that came about through that. And, and actually, I think all of us, we fed into each other's ideas. So it came about as a result of that conversation with everyone. And so as, um, as you articulated in, in the beginning, Aggie, um, the first key argument in many ways that we're putting forward, especially with international affairs, being a journal that's widely read, not just by academics, but also policymakers, is to grapple with this idea. It's it's quite a long-standing idea, actually, that the, the academics reside in the ivory tower um, and that our work is quite abstract and it might not always have a relevance for the real world. Um, and that actually we have an obligation and responsibility to make it intelligible and applicable. And that might often be a, a common refrain from academics who do work in, in foreign policy, policy arenas. And for myself, um, I've come into IR actually being keenly interested in foreign policy. And something that um, often is has been asked of me is, how does your work on foreign policy analysis relate to also your work on, which can be seen as quite theoretical, quite historical on race and imperialism. And so this question of how do we bring the two together um, was something that was really driving us. And there's been a lot of great, fantastic work, um, not just in recent times, but for decades actually by academics who've been working within international relations in other disciplines who have really developed and theorized on race and empire. Um, so we're not the first ones to do this at all. We're really building um, on, on their work. Um, but it's we really want to also connect it to the, the more theoretical work um, with, with policy. How do we theorize that relationship? So the first contention is to actually challenge the idea that there is this gap between policy and academia, because actually historically, as the articles demonstrate, as we say in our introductory article, they're very close, they have historically been very closely entwined. And so then we developed sort of two key ways in which um, they have been entangled. And the first is, um, the arguments that academics have historically, through the construction of hierarchies of race, through the construction of imperialist thought, provide um, a scientific validation, if you like, for colonial policies. So they really actually help to supply those policies through their writing, through their research, but also in a more embodied form, right? by actually moving, in some cases, out of the academy into policy spaces. Um, so carrying those biases and erasures with them into policy making. And so a num number of the articles um, developed that theme historically, but also in the contemporary era. So that um, carrying uh, that imperialist thought into policy might not always be overtly imperialist, right? But it might be through more masked uh, theories such as um, the international liberal order, right? Which perpetuates or reproduces some of that imperialist thought, but in a way that's a bit more occluded. The second way in which that policy in academia has been uh, entangled in relation to race and imperialism is that, well, vice versa, colonialism and imperialism as a status quo has also shaped academic work and knowledge production. And by that, we mean um, this, the lack of interrogation of imperialist, racist, racialized structures in world politics, which then they become naturalized through our knowledge production. Um, and one that uh, theme that was coming through a lot in, in a number of the articles is the naturalization of the state and of borders, right? And how that uh, reproduces um, racial policies or validates racial policies right, without interrogating them. And then the final way in which we look at that relationship is because in those first two arguments, we talk about the complicities, but actually also acknowledging that there have been contestations um, from academics uh, towards policy making and policy makers, but also the other way around, right? So there have been um, practitioners, um, particularly those from the global south. Um, operating in the policy, policy sphere who are challenging some of the received wisdoms from academia. And in that um, argument, in that section, um, and which also the articles, a number of the articles develop this theme, 
what we're trying to get across is when we say academics have challenged the policy sphere and vice versa, is also to expand who we understand as knowledge producers and who we understand to even be practitioners, right? So for example, if these are indigenous or racialized or marginalized communities working at the grassroots level, are we willing to see them as practitioners, right? Even if they don't have access to state power, or if we see those again, who are outside of the university, who are producing knowledges and might be in forms that we don't recognize such as oral testimony, such as through culture and art, um, are we taking that into consideration in our academic work? Um, and so just to finish off, I think uh, that the necessity to widen, expand what we see as knowledge and who we see as experts actually feeds in, we can talk about that a lot more with the developments with pensions and what a lot of people have been striking about. Um, so we're happy to talk about that a bit more. And I'll just finish saying both Jenna and I were really keen that some of these ideas we're trying to put and all of the contributors are putting forward with the special issue was also reflected in terms of who was a part of the special issue um, and to put that into praxis. So we have a number of amazing, brilliant, renowned academics um, who have written um, and contributed in the special issue, but was, we've also got upcoming um, fabulous but and less established um, junior scholars who are producing really cutting edge work. And we also wanted to bring in scholars who are independent scholars, not attached to an institution, though that didn't end up happening because they had to drop out because there was bereavement issues and so many challenges with the pandemic. Um, we really wanted to have a diversity of scholars from different parts of the world covering different regions. So, yeah, I think I'll end there. That's great. And, and what a brilliant sort of series of, of, of intentions and, and aims and, and what a brilliant kind of a spread of, of expertise that you've been able to, to draw on and bring into the conversation. That's so great. I suppose one question I, I have before we open it up, and I, and I do want to also return to those other issues that you mentioned, Dr. Ghani, there around the, the concrete struggles that, that academics are currently uh, ex experiencing and fighting for but what are your kind of key hopes really for, for the impacts of of the special issue who do you want it to reach and, and what in your kind of ideal world would be its effect uh, on those folks uh, perhaps we'll go back to dr marshall first and then uh, return thank you thanks for that question and a brilliant um continuation jasmine um, on the content and the contributions of the special issue. I, I do love research, I'll start there. However, when I was, when we, Jasmine and I were writing this, I was thinking a lot about my students. I was thinking a lot, especially my, I'm, I'm fortunate enough here in Germany that my cohort is quite international and quite diverse. And especially my students from the global South they, it's like they needed a language to make legible their experiences. So when thinking through with Jasmine about the special issue, I really wanted to produce a document that they could refer to in order to then do the work they wanted to do, right? So they didn't need to spend so much time deliberating and justifying why empire is important, why is race important, right? Why colonialism is important. And to be able to have the space to do it, as Jasmine mentioned in International Affairs, the number one journal of the discipline, I think now it really provides impetus for those students to then do the work that they've been longing to do, but couldn't because they just didn't have that foundation. So I think that's where my, my hope is for, for my students. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was really key. Um, what Jenna's just mentioned, thinking about students, because so, especially um, in recent years, whereas um, early on in my career, it felt like I was introducing these ideas to my students in my lectures. Now I'm finding there's a real appetite amongst students. I'm sure everybody here is recognizing that trend and they're wanting to hear us as their teachers raising these issues, talking about these issues, because it it feels relevant to them and it feels relevant to the world that they are growing up in. Um, and so if we weren't talking about it, I think there'd be a demand anyway, right? So it's, it's responding to that. Um, in addition, we do want to speak to policymakers, right? Um, so as mentioned, there might be an assumption that there's a gap between some of the more theoretical works on race and imperialism 
or as Jen and rightly mentioned that, well, this is something that happened historically in the past. So how is it relevant to us today? And thinking about not just applying these theories, but also the challenges and the pitfalls when it comes to trying to challenge these, uh, sorry, apply these ideas, because sometimes there might be good intentions, but if we're not thinking about, for example, if we're collaborating with grassroots communities or um, local indigenous communities in our field work, or when it comes to policy making, inadvertently actually we can reproduce some of those hierarchies that exist between policymakers and knowledge producers or people from the global north and the global south um, in just even in a structural sense, not just even in the knowledge that's produced. So just being really conscious of that is important. And I think also obviously to our community, right? Um, not just in international relations, very, there is a lot of interdisciplinary approach to some of these articles, but academics broadly, I think I've noticed that um, a number of colleagues who might not have engaged as much with these issues, given the fact that it's being published in international affairs. And then we also recently had the launch event at Chatham House. It almost allows people to talk about something that might have felt marginal or niche or a bit radical and recognizing that this is actually, it's, it's justified. This is a central issue in international relations and not to worry that they'd be pigeonholed. Um, so yeah, I, I hope, we hoped, that this would reach uh, sort of wide, quite diverse audiences. I think that's great and, and extremely well put. Uh, I mean, it's always a challenge, right? Of how does one sort of translate one's uh, aims and, and the content of academic thought or academic work for both those students coming up in the field, but also, as you say, and, and the purpose of these special issues directly speaks to this, of, of those people out there for whom sort of immediate decision-making and practical responses really are the order of the day. Um, who don't have the, the time or the scope for, for the kind of theoretical musings that we might uh, do here in the institutions that we work in. Great. Um, I wonder if it be, would be an idea to, to draw in some other um, speakers at this point. Um, there are some other questions I've got, but I would love to hear if any of our attendees have any questions uh, for our speakers at, at this stage or would like to follow up on any points raised so far. Uh, do throw your uh, microphones and cameras on if you'd like to come in or alternatively you can post in the chat um, I don't think we've got anything in there so far, but you're most welcome to do so. Uh, anybody want to, to come in with a question or comment at all? Great, we've got one uh, from um, Cortea, over to you. Are you able to pop your microphone on? Uh, otherwise, you could pop your question in the chat if the uh, microphone isn't functioning. Uh, oh, I can see your video. Yes, please do come in, uh, Cortea. Oh. Over to you. Hi. Sorry, I uh, I can't I can't see myself. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Yes. I love okay, you great. Know. Sorry, I just wanted to say. So I actually work for International Affairs. And I just wanted to jump in to say that it was really amazing working with Jenna and Jasmine. And I think what's been really great as well is that we've had so much positive feedback about the special issue over the last month um especially sort of on social media after the launch event that we did a couple of weeks ago which has been really great because um um we've had sort of a, a gender parity initiative in the journal around 50 50 and then with this issue as well like we were hoping that we it would have a supportive reception but there's always a worry that you know do you have to prepare for people questioning it on Twitter, for example? And we've had we've had none of that. It's been it's been a hundred percent positive response. That's wonderful to hear. My goodness, yep. <laughs> apologies for mispronouncing your name there. I, I think I was uh, referring to you by your surname rather than your surname. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. That's <laughs> being confusing. <laughs> um, but that's wonderful to hear. I don't know if um, either of our speakers would like to respond to, to that piece of news. Just that, I mean, Christina has been brilliant and um, <laughs> yes, I second that. really yeah. supportive and definitely one of the people that we were referring to in terms of the support that we've received, the enthusiasm really facilitating this and um, has made us feel very hopeful, right, um, that this is these changes, it might take a long time, but it's possible. 
Um, so I think giving that hope and, and facilitating is has been so important. So thank you, Christina. Yes, um, I just also want to to express my thanks and gratitude to the team, but I, I I was a little bit shocked. I think Jasmine and I, I think I could speak for Jasmine as well. We were a little shocked that there was like no, no negative. We were like, the, everyone's really been on board and we thought, okay, we're talking about race and empire and these can be hot button topics. But I think for us, or at least from my point of view, we really were quite rigorous in terms of the research. So it wasn't about, typically when we discuss race, it becomes quite emotive and it becomes very individual, individualized. And for us, it was really talking about a history and how it has continued and how certain processes sustain these logics and these, and, and these ways of thinking and, and producing knowledge. So I, we were very comfortable, I think, just standing in the project and knowing that uh, the work would speak for itself. And even if there were to be um, any negative feedback that we had done the work and IA had been, you know, quite, you know, rigorous in, in, the, in the peer review process. So we were really happy to see that there weren't any negatives, but we also were quite confident with what we produced as well. Absolutely. I mean, just to add to Jenna's points there that um, all of the contributors mentioned that a it was on it was probably one of the most rewarding experiences and positive experiences they had had um, in um, publishing, but also that it had been the most challenging <laughs> and most rigorous. So it's something like five or six reviewers, multiple rounds of reviews. We really pushed everybody, and thank you to all of the contributors for being very patient you and should, persevering. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of, and precisely for that reason, we we anticipated that these are arguments that can they'll receive pushback or could be challenged, and so therefore the argument needs to be really concrete and substantiated. And all of the um, contributors really rose to that challenge. That's great. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Christina, for, for coming into the conversation and, and thanks to, to both speakers for those responses. I mean, I, I think any of us who've done any work on these kinds of issues, uh, whether in our research or in our sort of institutional capacities, you know, it's no, no secret that, that it is a hot button issue and can precipitate all sorts of reactions. And, and my hope is that the more work of this kind takes place, the more mainstream it becomes. And as you say, the more really rigorous, ex excellent scholarship can demonstrate that these are not Sort of ideological issues or anything like that, but they're simply empirical and historical and, and contemporary issues which warrant, you know, serious academic study and, and research. And I think really we are moving apace in line with what uh, you were saying about students now, you know, having an appetite for this. You know, there's the the movement from from below, from the from the younger people, from student bodies, you know, demanding an accounting of, of these things. But also, I think institutions in parallel are starting to realise that this is. It's not a fringe question. It's something absolutely that it's at the heart of everything to do with our, our disciplines, but also our material and historical institutions and, and locations. Um, on which point, it would be interesting, I think, to link some of this to some of the kind of concrete struggles that academics uh, really, indeed, up until indeed yesterday, have been um, engaging in here in the UK. And again, we'll be doing so next week. And of course, the very devastating news that we've had just in the last 24 hours about the uh, cuts to pensions having been um, ratified. Um, how do you see your work in this area and the special issue in particular sort of speaking to these broader questions about things like workloads, inequality in uh, employment, uh, things like the, the race and gender pay gaps, of course, uh, casualized contracts that disproportionately affect certain uh, members of our communities, as we know. Um, what, what's your sense on how these things intersect from the practical sort of position that you're coming from in, in the special issue? I guess I can start on this. Um... Um, Jen, I'm sure will have comments to follow up on. I mean, I think they're really fundamentally linked um, because, well, even in terms of representation, um, having a diversity of academics, um, students, researchers um, within the university is um, in part dependent on having the equality uh, when it comes to pay, having equality when it comes to workloads, so when we're talking about issues of pensions and it seems like it's something quite distant and it might for some on the outside look like it's 
uh, a petty or a financial issue that we're only concerned with, it has a huge bearing on who's going to be willing to enter into the academy. So typically, historically, academia, especially in the UK or in Western institutions, has been the preserve of those who can afford to enter into academia. Um, it's been seen as a re reserve of a privileged elite. Um, more recent years, we've seen the doors of academia opening up to a greater diversity of scholars, whether it's um, on the gendered front or whether it's in terms of ethnicity. Now, part of that is because there's a sense of um, certain um, financial stability and security that academia can offer. I mean, typically, I know from certain ethnic communities that I'm uh, familiar with, in the past, it would be more normal for them to enter into sciences, for example, to even be able to go into humanities and social sciences, because science seems to offer a more uh, safer route in terms of earnings afterwards and security in terms of finding a job. So academia has opened up in more recent years. Now all of this news coming out that pensions are going to be slashed and for those who don't have sort of private family wealth to be able to rely on, that will have huge implications for them, especially more junior scholars. So all of this effort to diversify academia and therefore also expand the type of knowledge that we're producing and engage in questions of race and empire with which I think we should recognize that so much of that development and change has come from the fact that we've had more racialized people, people from minority, ethnic minority backgrounds in the academy who have reckoned this is our history, this is what's important to us, why is it not being taken seriously by, for example, IR? So a lot of that impetus has come from those scholars. So if we start reversing some of that because of these changes that we've seen, um, for example, with the decision yesterday, that's going to have a significant impact. Um, and I would just add as well, I and mean, that's the four fights as well. So it's not just about the, the pensions. And so I, I had to teach out um, earlier this week with um, students and staff and reflecting on the relationship between decolonizing the university and the strikes. And there is a deep connection because if we're fighting against overwork or we're fighting against precarity, those things uh, and gender and I think minor, ethnic minority pay gaps, those things uh, lead to, for example, increased compliance. Right. If you're worried about you don't know where you're going to be working, if you're even going to have a job in the next semester or the next year, um, then you're going to be uh, worried about what rocking the boat or pushing the boundaries when it comes to knowledge production. If you are overworked, you just don't have the capacity and the space, the mental energy to expand um, what we're theorizing about. Um, and again, to be engaging in more radical thinking. Um, so uh, all of these issues feed back into an incapacity to decolonize the university. Brilliantly said, Jasmine. <laughs> You're quite right. Couldn't agree more. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Marshall, at all? Um, not really. I, I, not really, but I just wanted to echo Jasmine's point about when we talk about decolonization, and I think many of us now have heard this term quite often, in some cases it's been misused, it's been instrumentalized. And for me, if there's one thing I have to say to students when, and, and interestingly enough, my students too feel as though the, the, the themes and the term decolonize has become emptied of its radical, um, of its radical ethos. Um, so the one thing I would say as it relates to the current strike action is that when thinking about decolonization, you always have to think about it through struggle, right? The material implications of it are always centered um, in our understanding of it. It's not, um, it's not simply a question of knowledge production, but to Jasmine's point earlier, who gets to produce the knowledge? What are the terms on which this knowledge um is uh is developed is 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 really important uh, can i just add um, one more thing to what jenna said which is a really brilliant point about the importance of struggle and um so when we see the strike action it might seem like well this is a distraction from the work and it's a distraction from the actual teaching and of course it is and we all want to be in the classroom with our students but um th the nature of of positive change and developments is going to happen through this discomfort, through the struggle. Um, and it's a point that Amal Abu Bakr made in, in the workshop that we had at, um, with Chatham House. And it was a really salient point. I would just also add that um, the goals that we've been talking about in terms of expanding 
what we consider as knowledge. And so one of the key points um, that's made in the articles and the introduction is maybe it's time that we increasingly looked to knowledge produced outside of the academy. Um, because anyway, there've been people who've been shut out of the university. I mean, that's been ongoing. Um, and the types of knowledge that's produced, not only in, of course, including it, but expanding beyond just thinking about um, articles published in, in journals, which is his very extortionate enterprise, but thinking about those who are producing knowledge, self-publishing in blogs, um, who are producing knowledge through art and culture, and they're telling their stories through oral testimonies. Um, there are multiple ways in which we can still draw from those knowledges without only seeking to find it within the academy. Now, if we're going to have more people who are prevented from entering into the university sector, then that becomes even more of an imperative. Absolutely, yes, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a great moment to maybe open up to some of our um, speakers here and also some of our audience members. Um, I, I'm sure some of you have, have been on strike recently and, and may have things to say about this. Um, and I think, you know, this, this point about you know, the, the non-separability of theory and practice, I think, is illustrated brilliantly, you know, in the work here in the special issue, but also, I think, as you say, in, in the struggle here surrounding paying conditions and such, that, that actually, you know, the way we think is very closely related to the way we act, and, and theory and practice, to that extent, have never been separable, that actually um, these, these material questions, these praxeological questions, you know, form the basis of the theories that we use in our fields, feminist movements, queer movements, um, movements for civil rights and, and anti-racism and all the rest of it. Great. Um, anyone else from our audience like to come in? I recognize a couple of um, faces and, and names and I will try not to um, refer to you by your surname in this case and go for your first name. Anyone like to come in? They're all ruminating. Indeed, or perhaps you've answered all, all the questions already that, that, that people <laughs> have. Um, <laughs> it means that you've, you know, you've done your job well if people are uh, already fully uh, informed. Good. I mean, I can pose perhaps one question to, to wrap us up if nobody else wants to come in. I mean, obviously, we've talked about how um, one of the key aims here of the special issue is to contribute to kind of mainstreaming and embedding conversations about race and anti-racism and, and ethnicity and, and uh, post and decolonial issues. Um, how in your experience do you think we can continue to sort of move beyond the communities who are already convinced of this agenda and draw in people who might be ambivalent in some way, who might be sort of outside the sphere of the conversation, even might in some contexts be, or some, some cases be, be hostile to this, think that actually, you know, IR is not about race and racism, it should be about, as you said, states or militaries or whatever it might be. So do you think it's important to try to sort of bring uh, other folks into the conversation? And, and if so, sort of how, how might we go about this? Um, thank, that's a fantastic question to conclude. Um, Jasmine, you don't mind if I, and I know you'll have much to say as well. Um, Jasmine and I, we thought about this, um, this question, and we, we, we wanted the special issue the audience of the special issue to be a broad church. And Jasmine spoke uh, about policymakers and students and fellow, fellow colleagues. But if, if one were to say, okay, you know, international relations is about questions of war and peace and so on. For me, it's, it belies the fact that the world that we live in was shaped by empire. So empirically, we must be able to grapple with and interrogate how empire has worked um, to, to create, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the, sorry. But we have to be able to interrogate how empire has been able to, um, to construct the institutions and the, and the processes that we understand in the contemporary world. So I just think um, to, to seek to erase that is to erase how the modern world has come into being. Um, so that would be my, my response to that, but 
Jasmine can put it in a way more eloquent yeah, way. <laughs> beautifully put, and I absolutely agree with, with what Jenna has said. Um, when we teach on these issues, it's it's always interesting that whatever might be seen as a starting point in IR, and certainly the way that I was taught IR, I migrated out of history into IR. So I had to sort of learn a lot of those theories and realize, okay, oh, there's a lot of stories that are not being taken into consideration here. And we, whatever might be seen as a starting point, you'll find is another starting point. And that starting point often is a very imperial one <laughs> and a colonial one. Um, so yeah, I think just from a, a perspective of rigor, um, and empirical accuracy, it's necessary to take that into consideration. The other thing I'd say is it's hard to convince or provide an answer, it just is, as a short response, right? And that's what the special issue is, is for. I mean, there's 15 articles there. Um, each of those articles draw upon um, years of uh, and really expansive research from each of the contributors and they painstakingly lay out the arguments that respond to that exact question. Um, so we would say we recognize it's a valid question, right? And we're not dismissing it. And that hopefully by engaging with the special issues, some of those queries and those doubts and those concerns would be addressed. Um, so yeah, that would be my response to that. Great, absolutely. And, and as, as you said at the beginning, you know, to, to have this in a journal like International Affairs really itself sort of performs that, that, that shift, that cultural change from this being a conversation had among a small minority of scholars to really placing it front and centre in, in the mainstream. And, and you know, its, its presence will be seen and noted by people across the um, political and theoretical spectrum in our field and beyond. So, so that's brilliant. Uh, we do have a question that has just popped into the chat. Um, thank you very much um, for that. Um, uh, Tahir is saying greetings from, from Kaisal. I've been lucky enough uh, to be a student of uh, Dr. Jenna Marshall. Thank you so much for the fascinating talks and conversations. Uh, studying in Germany, I've learned that there are uh, some boundaries for critical thinking that one should consider in academia, especially when discussing race, empire, and imperialism regarding actual political events, for instance, imperialist politi politics in uh, West Asia. So my question uh, for the speakers is, Considering your profoundly critical approach to mainstream IR and IPE, what constraints and challenges do you encounter in your work in academia uh, and how do you deal with them? Uh, a great question and I think loops back um, to the, the core themes of the special issue, but also these questions of, of, of praxeologically what it's like to do work like this in the field. Uh, great. Um, should we go first to uh, Dr. Ghani and then I'll turn to Dr. Martin. All right, it's my turn there. <laughs> Jenna beaming with pride there. This seems <laughs> um, and your all her students are very lucky to have her. Um, I mean, the, in terms of constraints faced, I think there's a really salient point um, that you make, Taha, which is that there are even boundaries not just for critical thinking, but also within critical thinking. Um, and I think one of the challenges initially in addressing these issues is that there was and still exists this idea that the paradigmatic boundaries lie between sort of positivist thought on one hand, very realist thought, and then you'll have sort of post-structuralism and post-modernism and critical thought on the other, um, or even liberal thought, right? Uh, which is supposed to be challenging that. And actually, if you dig deeper, even critical thought has at its foundation, um, a lot of racialized and racial concepts and assumptions. Um, so there's some been some really interesting and, and great work recently being done to excavate that, right? Looking at the work of people like, or interrogating the work of people like Foucault, um, interrogating the work of those uh, such as um, Jean-Paul Sartre, right? So where they might have see, been seen as the bastions of the critical response. Um, to more mainstream realist thought in the past and actually they have been found to be incredibly limited and reproducing a lot of those colonial tropes so that's a, a constraint and a barrier at first as well yeah having to not just uh, untangle some of the assumptions in that sort of more positivist mainstream ideas but also in the critical um, world um, I think secondly also one of the constraints 
is, and we've spoken to some of those already, and Jenna mentioned this before, that race or empire, also I can imagine um, those who work on issues of gender have to deal with this, those who work on issues of class have to deal with this, is an assumption that, well, this is very ideological. And if something is ideological, then it's not objective and it's not neutral. And again, what, something that special issue is seeking to challenge is, well, if you're engaged, if you're discussing issues of the state and you're accepting concepts such as borders or um, imperialist concepts such as, you know, what should be, um, who are the primary agents or what are the primary goals when it comes to world politics, then those are actually deeply embedded within certain um, ideological thinking. It's just that we've been so socialized within academia to think that these are, this, these are the norms and these are objective goals. Right? And these are objectively the main agents of IR that we don't see the ideology behind it. Um, so that's also, I would say, something that exists as a constraint. And one of the ways in which we, we challenge that is to point out that all of this might be ideological thinking. And once you recognize that, then you're in a position to critique. And the final thing before I hand over to Jenna, I'm sure she's got a lot more to say on this as well, is that um, uh, a, a question that I get a lot, um, and I think it's a very good question, and increasingly so, by the way, and from students, or it was a question that came up in the Chatham House event, and Jenna mentioned it, but we didn't have time to talk about it, is that it looks like sometimes when we talk about race and empire that we're only critiquing the West, um, and we, we're not taking into consideration actually aggressions and examples of imperialism from states from the global South, um, from the East, right? whether it's Russia, whether it's China or historical examples um, from the Middle East. Um, and I guess our position on this, and certainly one of the responses I give is that whether it's decolonizing, anti-colonialism, even feminism, or whichever ism we look at, which is supposed to be emancipatory, ultimately what those uh, theories and those approaches are concerned with and certainly what I'm concerned with is the issue of justice. So if something is unjust, it's unjust, right? So yes, I think it's necessary to also reflect on how decolonial, uh, anti-colonial, anti-racist thought can also be used to apply to those countries or agents from the global south, for example, non-Western contexts who are also sometimes reproducing um, imperialisms that have been inherited from the West as a result of the colonial experience, or also have historically had their own racisms that need to be attended to. So by no means would we say this is only a Western problem, but I, I think we do need to recognize that at least over the past 100, 150 years, the West has been the hegemonic dominant imperialist power um, on a global level. And so therefore, just from an ethical standpoint, beginning with those who are the most hegemonic and have the most power, it seems like a logical starting point. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Marshall, over to you. I don't know why we allow Jasmine to go first in these, <laughs> in these instances, because you, you pretty much covered everything I, I wanted to say, but I think Thinking about my own type of research, I'll just give a practical example, and Jasmine mentions this, is that one of the challenges is actually within the critical traditions themselves, for me and, and my work, it's very easy to oppose a Mersheimer, you know, but within my work, for instance, with development, you know, development policy and how we understand it, even critical work has been, um, have, have had as its foundation racialized logics as well. And uh, I know, for instance, with my work, typically, if we look at, um, you know, Atlantic slavery, for instance, even within critical work, you know, the enslaved are seen, are perceived of as objects of accumulation. And for me, I say, well, we have to push past this. You know, we have to be able to see them as historically and politically situated subjects, you know, with the ability to enact agency. How that agency looks is then a question for us as academics to, to render that intelligible. But it's not to just say, okay, they were dispossessed of their, of their being. It's to understand where that, um, social life 
um, had had space. So I think I would end there. Great, no, a great moment to, to end on, a great point to end on. And I, I mean, I agree completely. I, I, I can't, I think if there's anything to be hoped for in, in critical circles and critical theory, it's that it's very criticality can compel it to engage and, ref, and, and be reflexive about these oversights and about these emissions and elisions, which historically have peppered all manner of, of critical thinking, Marxian, post-structural, feminist, and, and all the rest of it. So I think the more we can embrace you know, a kind of intersectional approach and the more we can center these, these very, very uh, central questions of, of, of race and racism, um, you know, the more we do justice to the point of, of critical thinking, which as Dr. Ghani said, is at, one, at once this question of justice and emancipation, but also this question of reflexivity, right? Not assuming that aligning with a critical tradition somehow ring fences one from, 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 from messing up and from reproducing problematic power relations. Um, uh, that's great. Lots of enthusiasm for the, the questions and indeed the responses in the, the chat. Um, and, and also one or two folks saying they've had to leave early, but they've found the, the session to be really engaging and, and enriching. Uh, so a huge thank you. So I'm afraid we've reached the end of our, our allotted time. So I'll draw the conversation to a close. And um, please do join me, everybody, in thanking really, really uh, sincerely uh, both Dr. Ghani and Dr. Marshall for their fantastic work on this special issue and for their uh, really insightful comments today. Thanks also to, to Christina and everybody else at International Affairs for really, as, as has been said, having the, the courage to, to put forward, you know, a, a pretty kind of heartbreaking uh, special issue here. Um, and we look forward to more uh, publications from International Affairs and from other outlets too, pursuing this really important uh, line of, of research and this very important agenda. So thanks ever so much. Uh, warm regards to you both. I uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here.